Good afternoon. Welcome to the Ford Foundation and to our event on which I think contains the two buzzwords of the week for me, but both in the same place, innovations in monitoring and also how to pay for them. Uh, my name is Claire Malamed, and I'm the CEO of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. We're very happy to welcome you all here along with our co-hosts and partners for this event, the Government of Ghana, the Government of the UK, the World Bank, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Centre, and the Commonwealth Secretariat. And thank you to you all for your help and participation with this event. So we um, have a lot of speakers for you today, a very stimulating discussion. Also, we hope plenty of time for, for conversation and interventions from yourselves. But without further ado, let me invite the first panel, please, to come up to the stage, seat yourselves in no particular order. and. Um, I will introduce you and we will get started. Please help yourselves to a chair and a microphone. Thank you very much and welcome to everybody. So um, we're going to have a few uh, short remarks from each panel member in just touching on this critical discussion of, of innovation and how to make sure that the innovations are those which really start to make a difference. We've been hearing all week about the challenges of making progress on the very big and, uh, and complicated SDG agenda. We've been hearing, of course, from all of the country delegations about some of the great progress which is happening and some of the policy and technical innovations that countries have been developing to meet the challenges. But I think today we want to bring these together and really think about what are the innovations specifically in the area of data and monitoring. The SDGs, are we know, as we know, are built on data. That is what distinguishes, one of the things which distinguishes the Sustainable Development Goals agenda is the fact that it is an agenda which has specific targets and indicators attached and we can see quantitatively whether governments are actually meeting those commitments. And of course, this places a heavy burden on the data systems and infrastructures that have to support those demands and support that monitoring framework. And we've been hearing to this week about some of the challenges, but also some of the innovations and the way in which those pressures are fostering, creating incentives for many new and exciting innovations. So we're going to be hearing about some of those from the panel. Um, to my right is Katinka Weinberger, who is the chief of the UNSCAP Environment and Social Policy Section. Next to Katinka is Alexandra Bilak, who is the director of the Internal Displacement Monitoring Centre. To next to Alexandra is Matthew Rycroft, who is the permanent secretary at the Department for International Development in the Government of the UK. And then next to Matthew is Nabil Gohir, who is the assistant secretary general at the Commonwealth Secretariat. So, um, very warm welcome to you all. Um, I'd like to kick off perhaps with a, just let me um, start with a question to, to Matthew. Um, we've been, I've been at several events uh, this year celebrating the uh, anniversary of the uh, World Wide Web, which is perhaps the kind of innovation in itself which underpins so many of the other innovations that we're going to be uh, talking about this week. And, and he said uh, that innovation is serendipity. You don't know what people will make. This is obviously a challenge to governments and many of those others who like to plan and know in advance what the outcomes are going to be. But just talk, uh, talk us through what DFID, the different initiatives that DFID has to support these kind of creative approaches to measuring the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire, uh, for the question and for inviting me onto the panel. Thank you to the fellow panelists and to all of you for coming along and to, uh, in particular, our partners from Ghana uh, for coming together uh, on this uh, important uh, set of issues. Um, so in DFID, we like to pride ourselves on our creativity, um, but I wanted to start actually with a word about humility. Uh, because uh, we've just done our voluntary national review, our first one, uh, yesterday, in fact, uh, and we realized the hard way how difficult it is to get the necessary data at the necessary level of disaggregation, uh, even uh, in, in a uh, relatively developed country like the UK. So our Office of National Statistics, in fact, um, uh, found that we can report only on 74% 
uh, of the global indicators. So that's 180 out of the 244 uh, indicators in the uh, SDG framework. Now, I don't know if 74 is a, is a high percentage or, or low, but it's nowhere near 100, uh, which is what we, would, uh, what we are aiming for. Um, so anything I say about our support for other countries should be taken in the spirit of we don't have all of the answers ourselves, but collectively we will get closer to 100% uh, percent than, than if we do all of this on our own. So that's our, that's our approach. Uh, so I, I had four specific things to mention, if, uh, if, if I may, uh, rattling through them. First of all, there's the Inclusive Data Charter, uh, which last year's HLPF launched, uh, and where our Office of National Statistics uh, signed up alongside nine other champions. Uh, and we're finding that a... a that charter is a powerful way uh, of bringing together a political commitment uh, to disaggregation uh, alongside practical action. Uh, the second thing I wanted to highlight was that at the Global Disability Summit, which we were very proud to host uh, last year uh, in uh, London, uh, we signed up um, to uh, the Inclusive Data Action Plan. Uh, and uh, so the inclusive data charter, and we encourage uh, we encourage uh, others to join the charter and to uh, set out their own uh, action plans. Um, thirdly, we've now got this open SDG platform developed by the US uh, to report SDG progress, uh, and that's open and accessible to everyone. Uh, and uh, as I said before, the, the best way to creativity is to is to pool everyone's uh, efforts into into something open like that. Uh, and the last thing, uh, which is also the newest thing, is that we are setting up a data science hub uh, inside the Department for International Development, uh, which we hope uh, will be a powerful focus on all of the data science aspects of international uh, development, uh, really uh, not just to come up with the answers ourselves, but to help provide uh, technical capacity and support uh, for other countries uh, to help do that, so that we're all in this together uh, and that we can learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we'll be hearing um, a little bit more about that later, I hope. So let me now um, turn to, to you, Nabil. Um, obviously, at the, within the Commonwealth, you have many small island states and other small countries who, in a sense, are confronting specific and often quite challenging problems. So just talk us through how you work with them to embrace innovation, some of the challenges, but also, I guess, some of the opportunities of, um, of trying to embrace these new agendas in these countries within this particular situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Claire, with your permission, can I change my seat? The way we are sitting right now is very much like the 20th century, that men will huddle and women will huddle together. You know? <laughs> we are talking about SDGs. Perhaps we should practice you know, what we talk about, gender mainstreaming and stuff. Uh, Matthew, you know, um, don't take it personally. You know, I like it. <laughs> if I want to change your seat. So if, I, if, if, if there was another chance, perhaps I'll sit somewhere over there so that there's... Right, okay. We're glad that you registered that, and we will <laughs> assume that you are all sitting in a much more gender-balanced way. Let's just imagine that, okay, everybody? <laughs> right, okay. Um, talking of small states, um, the Commonwealth Secretariat is a relatively small organization. Uh, and I'm saying relatively because I'm getting this chance to speak after DFID. So if you compare us with DFID, 10 billion plus we are, when it comes to our development budget, it's 10 million plus, so slightly smaller uh, than mm -hmm. DFID, I would say. But if you are small, then you have to be smart. And you have to think innovatively that how can you leverage some of the resources that you have. So from the data perspective, some of the things which we are doing from SDG's perspective, the very first thing which the Secretary General, the current Secretary General, when she joined, did was that you said that we have global goals. And why don't we adopt SDGs as our strategic plan? So we were the first international organization of 53 uh, countries which adopted SDGs, other than the UN, as our global goals, as our strategic plan. Now we started from there. And then we looked at, OK, what are the data sets which are available to us? Uh, so the very first data set is the national statistics. We looked at what our member states are doing. Bangladesh has come up with this SDG tracker uh, together with UNDP. We thought it's a good tool. It's a very good way of presenting and monitoring what is being done. So why don't we promote what is being done in one of the member countries? So we are like an exchange. We want to promote that good practice. 
So through our innovation hub, we are promoting SDG tracker of Bangladesh, and, SG very, and uh, Bangladesh very kindly agreed that they will share those expertise with other developing countries. The second uh, type of data set that we have is from all the international organizations. World Bank has a huge data set. ILO, WHO, UNCTAD, all of them. In our case, we don't have the capacity to actually go and do surveys and have that data set. In our case, we are in five inhabitant, inhabited continents of the world. So for us, it's very difficult. We are neither regional, we are not global, but our reach is global. So what we did was we started contacting international organizations, starting with the World Bank. UNCTAD, ILO, and WHO, we requested APIs for their data sets. They were very kindly shared it with us. We created an algorithm to extract data of 53 countries. And now we have our own data platform, which we have created to see how we are doing. So talking about innovation, talking about money, we have not spent any money on two of these initiatives. Thirdly, <clears throat> uh, then regional uh, mechanisms. We have a European Union, African Union. European Union is much more organized when it comes to data. And they are doing massive trainings for us to my staff to see how they have organized, how they collect data, how they collate data, how they standardize it. So this, this technical exchange which is taking place between us and the European Union in terms of building the capacity of the Secretariat. And thirdly, we have partnered with Bloomberg. We thought that looking at national data sets at the regional level, and also if we look at the private sector data sets, because it's not only stock and bond and investment and trade, the way they are organizing themselves is they're looking at their new departments, which is more like environmental, social, and governance, new energies, all of that related to SDGs. So it's good to triangulate that data that we have from the government side with the private sector side. So that's another way of doing it. I know you want me to stop here, and I will. And then we are looking at new sources of data, uh, which are there. So new sources of data is geospatial data, uh, then big data, uh, and also some of the experimentation which is going on in the Commonwealth countries, such as Necton, which is deep sea uh, data mining, you know, which is going on right now. So we are trying to see, OK, how this could be linked to some of the work which we are doing. So for us, there is no choice but to be smart and innovative. We are very rich in innovation. We are not that rich. And thanks to DFID, they gave us an A-plus rating in the last uh, of uh, their evaluations. Thank you. I'll stop it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nabil. And I think I'm sure there'll be questions about some of those. I'm always struck in this conversation by how much when we talk about data, how much of the conversation is actually about combining different data sets and how that's so often where the sort of richness in this conversation comes. Let me um, turn now to, um, to Alexandra. We've heard a little bit from Matthew about the Inclusive Data Charter already, and I know that one of the things that um, you found in the course of thinking through your participation in the Charter was that um, countries don't publish information on the ages of internally displaced persons, which is obviously a critical factor in understanding kind of what their needs are. So can you just, just talk us through a little bit some of the innovations that you're helping to foster around how we can address, address those very specific data gaps for that very vulnerable group? Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, the head of IDMC, which is the global provider of data and analysis on internally displaced people. So we're talking about quite possibly one of the most vulnerable uh, group of people in the world, and certainly those who best fit the definition of often being left behind in many of these uh, policy debates and, and, and other processes. Um, it's true, we recently published two um, policy briefs with UNICEF, which were launched uh, last week at, at the HLPF, looking at um, internally displaced children and some of the challenges that they face in accessing education, but also some of the challenges uh, that, that we're looking at when we consider that more and more IDPs now are living in urban areas, and what does that mean in terms of responding uh, in, in, those, in those contexts. And what we found, we were just trying to estimate just the scope and the scale of, um, of, of, of this phenomenon for children, and we found that there are very few countries 
um, and very few actually data sets that disaggregate um, IDP numbers by sex, age, and other characteristics. Um, and we were forced to actually estimate, to, to, to do a global estimate just using um, uh, population distribution uh, models. And we managed on the, that basis, because there were only 10 countries of all the countries in the world that actually published uh, data on IDP children, using those population models, we just estimated roughly that out of the 41.3 million conflict IDPs right now in the world, there are 17 million children. That's just on the numbers, okay? So, of course, we're always trying to, to, to go beyond the numbers and to understand what the needs are and what the specific vulnerabilities are, because understanding those trends is really key for targeted responses and for being able to plan not just a humanitarian response, but also a longer-term development uh, response. And, and it's true that the, the implications of not knowing that, uh, the implications of not having access to that uh, data are huge. Um, it means that you, can't, uh, that, that you can't provide assistance when it comes to you know, shelter, education, to psychosocial support that's often needed in, in displacement situations. And that we know that in many uh, countries, we're looking at, in a, in a displacement context, we're looking in particular when it comes to education challenges, schools that become... Uh, that are overcrowded, schools that are damaged as a result of conflict, insecurity, or even disasters. So a huge number of children that are right now in extremely vulnerable, uh, in extremely vulnerable situations, and um, but who are completely falling off the radar screen. So, um, so from our perspective, that I mean, IDMC's job is is basically, you know, you were talking about combining different data sets. I mean, our job is really to um, basically stitch together the available data sets to try and build as complete and as comprehensive a picture so that we can inform operational responses and, and, and policy responses as well. But we find that the gaps are still huge. So we're really glad to have joined the, the Inclusive Data Charter. Uh, we joined it when it was launched last year. And, um, and it's really very much to reflect how we view, first of all, how we view the issue of internal displacement. We view it very much as a as an issue that goes far beyond a humanitarian challenge. It's an issue that cuts across all the SDGs, um, even though it doesn't have its own SDG. It's a, it's, it's, it really has direct implications uh, with many of them. Um, we actually, we'd be very keen, we're, we're currently supporting countries to see how internal displacement could even be incorporated as part of their national review, um, uh, their, their voluntary national reviews. Um, but nevertheless, it, because of the data gaps, we're facing uh, uh, many challenges. The data gaps when it comes to internal displacement are linked mostly to access issues. You know, we're talking about countries, if you imagine Yemen, Syria, CAR, DRC, where there's actually no, not even a proper, you know, a full geographical coverage of the country, which means that there are huge numbers of people who are right now not even counted uh, by humanitarian agencies on the ground, let alone by the national governments. Uh, there are issues linked to interoperability. You know, we often, we often uh, remind our our audience is that internal displacement is often the starting point of many of these onward cross-border journeys. There are links between IDPs and refugees and migrants, yet the data sets are not connected. So IDP data sets, you know, the, we stop counting IDPs the moment they leave their country, and that's a huge problem as well. There's, of course, a huge, uh, there are huge challenges linked to quality and consistency of the, of the data sets that we, that we have access to, and that's where IDMC's role comes in, trying to make sense of the different data sets that often use uh, hugely disparate um, definitions, standards, uh, methods, and trying to, to bring all of that together into a coherent whole is, is, is massively challenging. And then, of course, there's a huge gap when it comes to the, the regularity and the frequency of the data collections. What we see, uh, uh, no, I mean, obviously in fragile countries, it's a, it's a big issue, but even in, in high-income countries, you were talking about uh, the UK right now, it's true that even in high-income countries, we see that data... Uh, collection stops after a certain amount of time. So, for example, in the context of a disaster displacement, a government will record the number of people who become evacuated after a disaster, but that counting will stop usually after 15, 20, 30 days. And we know for a fact that many people remain displaced for long periods of time, even after a disaster, if you think about Hurricane Katrina and other, in, and, and other events. So the frequency and the regularity of that data collection is, is, a, is a key gap. And of course, it means you know, more, more financial resources are needed to put in place the right kinds of systems. So let me finish by saying what we have achieved since we joined the, uh, the, in the Inclusive Data Charter. 
uh, and we've achieved a lot across the five principles that are outlined in that, in that charter. We hold the world's um, global internal displacement database, and that database, I'm glad, I'm glad to say, keeps growing and growing uh, every, every month and every year. We're recording more and more displacement events, uh, and we've done a lot of progress when it comes to monitoring the much more invisible forms of displacement linked to slow onset disasters like droughts, which I think is a huge, and sea level rise, which is hugely relevant in some of the Pacific small island states that you mentioned. We've also innovated a lot, and we're using new technologies, uh, social media, big data analysis to identify and detect new uh, situations of internal displacement that weren't even on our radar screen previously. And I would say the biggest investment, and, and I think what is going to be really the way forward of policy making on this issue, um, is uh, our investment in uh, developing risk models, so probabilistic risk models, so that we can anticipate the type and the volume of displacement that we may expect um, as a result of certain types of natural hazards, but also conflict and, and, and insecurity events in the future, and so that we can help countries prepare and plan for this type of um, displacement. I know you want me to finish. Uh, <laughs> I have so much still to say, but let me just finish by saying, I, for, for me, yeah, just to, to sell the IDC to whoever would like to join the internal, the, not the internal, the inclusive, um, the inclusive data charter. It's a, it's a key opportunity to really build partnership, partnerships, and to put in place those kind of collective efforts to improving the quality of data. Um, and, and we've already seen incremental, like we've made incremental progress ever since we've joined up, so I would encourage everybody else to join. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And I think a good reminder that innovation is not always about sort of whizzy techie gadgets, but it's also sometimes institutional innovations. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, we're talking about a very wide range of things here, and we shouldn't always assume that that innovation is not innovation unless it has a, uh, a di digital element. So... Thank you very much for that. So, so um, turning to, to Katinka, in your region in Asia and the Pacific, I think we're seeing, and thanks also to the work of SCAP, that different regions are making different progress against different SDGs. Um, so just tell us a bit more about that, and, and in particular, of course, why partnerships, which is another theme of the week, are, are so important to unlocking progress and to making sure that none of those regions are being left behind. Thanks a lot, Claire, for inviting ESCAP to be here today. Um, ESCAP is one of the five regional economic commissions for um, regional economic and social commissions. And uh, one of the role that we have is to support our regions in follow-up and review of the 2030 agenda. So what I would like to speak about a little bit this afternoon is an approach that ESCAP has developed to help our countries to better understand uh, on where they stand in respect to the implementation of the goals. As you all know, the SDG um, indicator framework is very large. We have 232 indicators. So it's really difficult to build a simple narrative from this very complex framework. And that's what we've tried to do, to, to, to give countries a tool at hand to um, have a more um, simplified narrative, to, to be able to build a more simplified narrative. So we have developed an approach at ESCAP that really aims to answer two big questions. One is, where does the Asia-Pacific region as of now and the sub-regions uh, stand? Um, in respect to each of the 17 goals. And the other question that our approach attempts to answer is, by 2030, how likely will it be based on the current trajectory that the region and the sub-regions are able to achieve the target? So really two big questions. And where the first question is about the now, where do we stand now, what, does we see, what do we see now? And the second is about what the future is likely to bring us based on the current trajectory. And um, if I could just ask them, I've brought three slides just to show you how this looks. If you could pull up the first slide. That's right, yes. So what this looks like then is for the first big question, um, and based on uh, the most recent data that is available, that Asia and the Pacific is not on target to reach any of the 17 SDGs, right? So we need accelerated progress on all fronts. And um, for uh, many more goals, uh, progress is stagnating. And then we see three goals there where progress is actually regressing. So we're going backwards. And I think that's a really important message to bring out. And if I could have the second slide. 
So this is the dashboard, the SDG dashboard, which attempts to answer the, the second big question. It looks at the targets under each of the SDGs, and it shows you that by 2030, our region is likely to achieve many of the targets, and those are the boxes in yellow, um, sorry, in green, but it's also stagnating in many more, and these are the yellow ones. And then where progress is, again, um, needing reversal are those targets that are uh, defined in red. But the very interesting part of this uh, dashboard is are the gray boxes, because that's, in fact, where no data is available. And that's a very important message, too, that we still don't have enough data for most of the targets um, in our region. And if you then could move to the next slide. Um, this is an overview by the five sub-regions um, in Asia and the Pacific. And I will not go into detail. I just want to show you that, really, it shows the diversity of our region because the um, the different sub-regions are making progress and are having a lack of progress in totally different goals. But what is important is that all goal, all regions are not making sufficient progress in any of the goals. So um, you could move on. So we think this really is a, is a useful approach from various perspectives because first it allows our region to prioritize on where action is required. We're also using it to look at complementarities between different development agendas um, in our region. For example, we work uh, to closely together with ASEAN, who's developed an SDG complementarities report that helps us to see how these different uh, development um, agendas um, are on track. And the third one is around data availability gaps, as I mentioned before, and the opportunities to strengthen these gaps. And then your second part of the question was around partnerships and what part, how partnerships can help to move this agenda forward. Just generally looking at the 2030 agenda, um, partnerships, of course, have received a much higher priority. And um, overall, we think that because of their ability to create new responses, um, to address problems and um, critical issues in societies because of their ability to enhance interconnections be between different stakeholders to bring on board different resources, different pieces of knowledge, and different opportunities for actions. They're really crucial. So partnerships can really help to deal with the complexity that I think all of us agree needs to be addressed if we really want to make a transformative, uh, transformational change and, and progress on the 2030 agenda. But finally, partnerships also really help to increase learning and understanding because you have different people on board and there's a lot to, to learn from, from, from these different uh, perspectives and um, ideas and values. So partnership, of course, also have a role to play in the context of the follow-up and review agenda. Firstly, because they can help to um, fill critical information gaps. We just organized a side event yesterday where our representative, the Minister of Legal Reforms of Timor-Leste, expressed how he was working together with civil society organizations to um, get a better understanding on, um, on uh, gender-based violence because there was simply not sufficient available availability of data in the country. But we also think it's really important because it helps to build a narrative around the data. And while the um, bars that I showed you earlier give a really good indication on where we stand, it's also important to understand why we're not making enough progress. And I think that's where partnerships also come in very importantly. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you. I'm going to um, turn over now to questions and comments from the floor. While we're all, while you're thinking um, of your question, I'm going to. Um, I have one for for all of you, which occurred to me. I mean, the hypothesis behind the SDGs is that, or behind the monitoring framework, is that through collecting this data, through monitoring, through understanding progress, we will create both the incentive and the possibility to accelerate progress. So my question to all of you is, of these innovations which you've been talking about and this investment in different ways from your institutions in trying to do things differently, which have been the things that have had most success in improving outcomes and actually changing the outcomes, which after all is the, the point of the exercise is not to have the perfect monitoring framework, but to have the monitoring framework that drives progress. So you can all um, mull on that while we um, turn over to the floor for any questions, comments from the floor. 
while they're thinking about it, does anyone like to uh, tackle my question? Matthew. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question, and it's a, it's a very good one to ask ourselves. I mean, I'd, oh, actually, if, I, I think I might, I, I mentioned four things, but I mentioned, might mention a fifth <laughs> to answer this question, um, which is uh, a quite a specific example, which goes to um, Alexander's point about combining uh, the sort of flash new stuff with some fairly standard uh, data, which is a, a very interesting um, uh, bit of innovation which we have um, been proud to, to part fund, which is about using um, remote sensing, so geospatial satellite technology in order to work out where people are and then combine it with local sensors in places like the DRC. Um, now, uh, I think that there's, I, I don't think we could realistically say yet that that, that, that combination of, of two very different types of data has, has improved the actual outcomes of the people in DRC, but it's a sort of first step towards doing so. Thank you. Anyone else, Nabil, do you want to contribute to that? And then I'm going to sure. turn over, I can see Michael there. Uh, please go ahead, and then I'm going to... Do I have your permission to stand up and sit once, you know, because I'm wearing a Fitbit? <laughs> that is all that data which it's collecting. I'm just, Does it uh, work if you just wave your hand up and down? <laughs> so, uh, that's, uh, that's the point which I want to make, and that is seeing is believing. So in the evening, if I have not done my steps, I'll feel, look, you know, there's something which is lacking. Mm -hmm. So we all have perceptions about our countries uh, when it comes to voluntary national reviews, and there is reality which is out there. So once the data is put forward, you're able to see how much have you achieved and how much distance you have to travel. Mm -hmm. So that's important. My second point would be that you know, it's not only the numbers which matter. The qualitative data is also important, telling stories of success mm -hmm. and saying this is possible, this is achievable, we can do it. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, uh, going to my board of governors, to my member states, those uh, touching stories have been very, very successful mm -hmm. in terms of stimulating, you know, uh, and, you know, having some ideas and prompting them to do more of, of this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn over to questions now, please. If you have other things to add when, when we come to the answers, please do. I see a lady in green over there with the microphone in your hand. Then I'm going to go to Michael and then gentleman at the back there, please. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I know there are a few others that want to ask questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to um, ask the panelists, please, to, to respond to what they've heard. We have our illustrious keynote speaker um, ready um, to speak to us, and there will be another panel and another opportunity to, to ask questions. But, um, but please, let me invite you all, starting uh, with Katinka, to just respond to what you've heard. I think a really real interesting focus here on citizens, citizen data, um, and the role of citizens in this enterprise, which I think is useful is a useful reminder when so much of this week is taken up with government reporting. So uh, please, over to you. But if we can just be brief, a, a minute or so each, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted, in full disclosure, to say I'm not a statistician. I'm not a data person. And in response to this question on whether we're putting too much efforts on building indicator frameworks, this is a discussion that I constantly have with my colleagues. Um, when we go in country and provide support to VNR um, reporting, how much emphasis, emphasis should we be putting on data and statistics? Aren't country taking that too far and um, worrying too much about having the adequate indicator frameworks in place rather than also then moving on to SDG implementation? However, I do think, and that leads to your question, that with the monitoring framework that we now have in place, I think we are contributing to a changing narrative where before you know, we would only be able to compare economic growth rates around countries, across countries, we now have a much better modality in place to look at different aspects of progress on the 2030 agenda. And I see that making a real impact, for example, at the level of our commission where member countries report back, where they now have much better tools at hand to look at the different aspects of the 2030 agenda. So I think it makes a difference. Thank you very much. Alexandra. Thanks. Um, I'm also not going to be able to answer, you know, probably any of these questions. They were all excellent questions, but maybe just a few thoughts um, linked to some of the questions that were asked, but also based on some of our own lessons learned. You asked about, our, you know, 
what 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 is the most successful in terms of reaching outcomes. Um, our lessons at IDMC, I mean, maybe two things. One is, um, and it is linked to the question about the bias in the data and how to, how to of course, you're never going to avoid that, I think, completely because you are looking at very different sources of data that are all sort of somehow having to be streamlined into a single channel. Um, but And that's very much what IDMC has to deal with. And, and I would say on top of it all, we're dealing with an issue. We're actually trying to count an issue that is um, quintessentially so political and so sensitive that there are all sorts of reasons why we the the, the data is never uh, you know there's a lot of uncertainty let's say around that data and, and we found that the best way of approaching that um, and to, to to come back to the example that Matthew you were using about the DRC we're actually working right now in the DRC because we we realized that the data that we had on internal displacement in the DRC was so bad and so um, so insufficient and so incomplete. Um, the, the only way to do it is to come to, to bring all the different data providers together. And I admit we're not working with citizen-based, uh, you know, data providers. It's the main data providers that are there, so that we can at least have a conversation and try to align our perceptions and our definitions of what we even consider to be an internal displacement situation. And I think that's the only way to do it is to try and align as much as possible the methodologies, the conceptual frameworks, the the the, the conceptual models that we're using even to then collect that data and trying to then ensure that all the partners on the ground working on the ground are using the same sorts of uh, methods. And then, sorry, just the second, the, the, the last uh, thing that I'd like to say, and it, it relates to what was said about too much data. Um, you know, I don't want to say I completely agree with that, but it's true that, that I have a sense in which, you know, because we're not about SDG monitoring. We're about raising awareness of the issue of internal displacement and trying to get more political mobilization around the issue. And I think data only goes so far, especially quantitative data. You know, it stops uh, at, at a certain level. And I think, in a way, a more compelling and a more powerful way to raise awareness and get that political mm -hmm. buy-in is telling the story, the, the narrative around that data, and bringing out the human stories yeah. of IDPs. And we found that actually doing that somehow gives us exponential um, interest and, and more impact. Thank you. Data is stories. Matthew. Great comments. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I thought the two big themes that came out, which I want to address, were first of all, who decides uh, what is the role of the individual citizen versus the government and who does the aggregation and the checking? And then secondly, the good enough uh, challenge. So on the first, you know, the SDGs are the United Nations SDGs. The United Nations is a member state-based organization. The people who actually agreed the SDGs DGs with 193 heads of government of the individual countries of the United Nations. So it might not be a particularly popular view, but my answer to the question is that it is actually up to each member state to sort this out. So if you happen to be a head teacher in India, then your way to get your bit of data into the system is through the central authorities of your country, of India. In the UK's case, we did a very big effort, nowhere near big enough, by the way, but a big effort to get our voluntary national review out from the centre to encompass everyone else. But it was our initiative to do that, and it had to be ours. So I, you know, I, I think, basically, the people who need to decide how to do this are the, are the central authorities of each state, and, and, and that is certainly the way that, that we will seek to use our expertise through our Office of National Statistics to improve, improve others. And then on the good enough, I mean, it's a great, it's a great challenge, and we, we grapple with this in DFID every day, one way or another. And my short version is that DFID is way better at this than any other bit of the British government that, that I know of. Um, and I do know a few. Uh, way better, but still actually not good enough. Uh, and we require much better data, not so much for accountability, but for decision making. And the thing that I actually worry about is the, is, is the robustness of the data in order to make, for instance, resource allocation decisions. And on that, we are nowhere near good enough. And even we, with our 74%, with our even, if, even if that is a high number, it's not very disaggregated. You can disaggregate it on one type of issue, for instance, but, but on any one bit of data, but, but not, uh, not, not across the piece. So I think a, a lot further to go. Thank you, Matthew. And Nabil. Um, thank you, Claire. Now, the very first one on data availability and its quality when we talk about algorithms. I talked about the types of data which are available. You know, statisticians are professionals, and there are data standards all across the globe. There are ISO standards, two types of standards on data. Then also, in the international organizations, you know, uh, such as the World Bank, UN system, have been working uh, on these data sets for a long, long time. As I said earlier, from our side, it's a problem when we create an algorithm. We want to see, okay, 
the data sets which we have from the World Bank are slightly different you know, from the UN system. So for us, in terms of standardizing uh, that data set, um, from our perspective, could be challenging, but it's not uh, impossible. It's possible to have a good picture. Now, on, uh, if I may uh, build on what uh, Matthew has said in terms of worrying about uh, good enough data, I think, to my understanding, you know, you, you're in a better position to talk about DFID or, or the UK, but um, it's not about worrying, it's about being cautious, it's uh, being about uh, sensitive to some of these things. You would have realized by now that I'm a very visual person. So um, I'm not going to take a selfie, but if I take a selfie of myself, you know, I'll be cautious, I'll be able to improve, you know, because these are some of the things visually which you're able to see, look, this is where you are and this is where you would like to go. Mali, infant mortality, you know, how to do it. There are very inclusive mechanisms to my understanding right now, and I'm going to come back to this one when I talk about India and others. Uh, in the international system, with the way UN is doing it, the way the governments are doing it, and there's, there is a variety uh, um, of different models which are being used by different countries. But of course, when it comes to infant mortality, to my understanding, WHO, if I were you, you know, perhaps uh, that would be my first uh, port of call. Uh, India on, uh, on education or what is being done uh, in a particular school and different schools are doing. Yesterday evening, I had a very long chat with uh, Helen Clark you know, on some of these issues. And she showed me uh, the first civil society report which has been done by New Zealand. So it's not only that the member states are doing VNRs. We know that VNRs are being done by international organizations. OECD is doing it. And another example was Los Angeles as a city has done it, and they are showcasing it. So it's not only you know, what that the national governments are doing, but this is being done. You want to see how you are doing and how you are contributing to these global goals. Nine to one to on uh, who does what. You know, I think it, again, depends you know, at the city level, at the, uh, the state level, at the national level, there are mechanisms which are in place. And civil society, especially in a country like the US, you know, will be able to contribute you know, wherever they would like to. And well, another point in the same vein, which I want to make it that you know, uh, global is a space which is aggregation of local. So the real action is at the local levels. When you put it all together, that is the picture which we see. Last one. Um, Real people, a bottom-up approach, again, I'll go back to uh, uh, what uh, Helen Clark said, and that is, if you don't have an opportunity at the state level, perhaps there's an opportunity, uh, and something else which was mentioned yesterday evening was that universities, they have started doing it, you know, at the university level, and across the universities, association of universities, they are doing it. So I'm really happy to see that this, is, this has become like a global movement, and not only the state level thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nabil. A big round of applause for the panel, please. Thank you. And now it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome to the lectern, please, our keynote speaker for today, the uh, Honorable Alpha Osman Timbo. The Thank you very much, uh, distinguished delegates. Uh, I was not really expecting that I would be a keynote speaker. <laughs> uh, we are very busy with our delegation, um, uh, observing some of our reviews. Uh, but here we're talking about data, data, data. Um, back home, I'm the Minister of Basic and Senior Secondary Education. And uh, in terms of the SDGs, of course, you should know that uh, mine has to do with the SDG 4 which uh, talks about inclusive and quality education for lifelong, lifelong learning. Uh, but today, I just want to make a few points on the issue of data. As far as uh, uh, Sierra Leone is concerned, uh, the data is a very important issue because whatever decision that we have to make as a government, we have to depend on data, 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 and for us, especially in the Ministry of Education, for us to be able to make informed decisions, we have to rely on data. And not only data, but the data has to be reliable. It has to be credible data, because sometimes we make use of data that is controversial. People may have different ways of obtaining their data. But the first institution that has the mandate 
for the collection of data in the country is the National Statistics of Sierra Leone. That's the national institution. One of the speakers, in answering one of the questions posed by one of the delegates here, when they ask, where do they channel the data? The answer is that you have find that you can do it through your national institution. So in Sierra Leone, the National Statistics Office is the institution that is responsible for the collection of data from all MDs and other institutions that also collect data, including the uh, development partners. But then the new administration decided to add a new structure in that. Through the Office of the President, we established the Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation. And we, we call it the DSTI. And this is under the supervision of His Excellency the President. And the reason is simple. After the, we took over the administration of government a year ago, we came to the realization that uh, after the war, a lot of things have been disaggregated. And for us to be able to, to, to chart a comprehensive way forward, it is important for all the institutions to be able to collect and have their own data. So as for us to be able to interpret and, info and arrive at informed decision. So the Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation was established under the office of the president. And it is the responsibility of this directory to work with all the MDAs, including my own ministry, the Ministry of Education, to make sure that we collect the data that is relevant for all M uh, sustainable development goals that we have all adopted in the, through the United Nations system. For the Ministry of Education, we have the EMIS, the Education <laughs> Management Information System. This is also a system that is set up to report to the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation that work with the central statistics where all the data has been collected. So it is the responsibilities of the, data, the various departments to collect the data that is relevant to their own operations. For instance, in the Ministry of Health, it is our responsibility to make sure that all health institutions from the national to the local level are collected. How many patients, how many children that are admitted on a daily basis, and how many nurses that we have. So in terms of making sure that we improve on the reliability of the data, more attention is being concentrated at the local level because it is through the local level that the, the data is generated to the MD and finally to the Director of Science, Technology, and Innovation and to the National Statistics of Australia. In doing this, we have benefited immensely from our development partners of DFID, for instance, is one of our development partners, but in driving home the process, it is the UNICEF as an organization that is coordinating this particular aspect to the point that sometimes we have the mixed survey, the multi-indication cluster survey. This is led by UNICEF, but the European Union, the World Bank, uh, DFI, they are all partners that support the government in time to make sure that we collect information that we make use of in order for us to be able to take informed decisions. In the Ministry of Basic and Senior Secondary Education, <coughs> where a greater part of the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 4 is concentrated, we have enormous data that we collect for the purposes of making decisions. For instance, when you talk about the early childhood, <coughs> education, coming to the primary, to junior secondary and senior secondary, uh, which constitutes the basic education, these are all data that are very critical uh, for us to be able to make informed decisions. So on the whole, we this is the structure of collecting as well as uh, making use of information in my country, right at the local level for the education at the school level, at the district level, then to the, the Ministry of Education headquarters, to the Directorate Science, Technology, and Information in, uh, Innovation, and to the National Statistics Union. So whatever information that is needed that has to do with the general overview of government machinery as well as the geography of the country, it is being derived through the national uh, Statistics Union Office. So in your various countries, we don't know how you 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 go about doing the process, but uh, essentially, this is the way it is being done in my country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister, and I think an incredibly important reminder that while we talk about innovation, it's those basic foundations on which innovation needs to be built. 
and the basic, the surveys, the administrative data systems, which is collecting data from individual schools and clinics, which is the, the bedrock upon which any other innovation that we might want to uh, that we might want to experiment with depends. So many, many thanks to you, Minister. And we will now turn to the, the, uh, the next panel, please, where we can begin to, to focus more on the, um, on the financing agendas um, and how we're going to pay for all of this. So if I can uh, release you, Minister, and allow you to, uh, <laughs> to head back to the, the important work of the High Level Political Forum. Thank you. And invite the speakers, please, for panel two to come up to the stage. Thank you very much and welcome to you all. I think there is already a huge amount of food for thought um, for all of us in that first, in the keynote address that we just heard and the first panel. And, and I hope that you all are now extremely well positioned to start to think about with this, the needs and the, the kind of essential building blocks of the system that we just heard about from the minister plus all of the possible innovations which are being tried that we heard about from the first panel. We're now going to focus in very squarely on what is the, the oil that powers this system. Perhaps that's not a good metaphor as we think about climate change. The renewable energy which powers this system, um, which is the, uh, the resourcing. So let me first introduce the panel and then we'll have uh, invite some uh, remarks from each of them, and then they will have um, time again for questions. So on my right is um, Lilia Hachem-Nas, who is the director of North Africa for the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Um, next to Lilia is Daniel Dubas, who is the delegate of the Swiss Federal Council mm -hmm. for the 2030 Agenda. Next to Daniel is the Honourable Abena Oseyasare, who is the Deputy Finance Minister of Ghana. Welcome, Madam. And next to, uh, next to her is Mahmoud Maldin. Thank Mahmoud. Welcome, Mahmoud, the uh, Senior Vice President of the World Bank Group and also a board member of the Global Partnership. So welcome, a uh, very warm welcome to you all. So um, let me start with you, Minister. Um, in Ghana, as, as we know, uh, we're very proud to work closely with the government of Ghana across a number of different, um, number of different initiatives. And we know that you have very high level political support for data, your president, your vice president, are keen champions of this agenda. And I know that in saying that, if I, you will immediately become the envy of many other statisticians who are in the room who don't have that level of support from their government, and nor do they uh, have the level of the financial support and the regularity of funding that they wish from their government. So just tell us, tell them, really, the, the secret of how... What are the sorts of arguments that are convincing for governments, for finance ministers such as yourself, other parts of governments, to persuade them why data is important and why governments should invest in this resource? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I bring you greetings from Ghana. And it's true, yes, we have the high level political support for data in Ghana. Because for us, and like everybody has mentioned, we need data to make informed decisions. And um, for us as, as Ghanaians, we have prioritized the SGDs. We've localized the SGDs and aligned our national budget and our medium-term framework to the SGDs as well. You know, all these things depend on credible data. So certainly there is a need to invest heavily in data. Also, we have also um, prioritized and programmed to observe our, our population census over the recommended period of um, an interval of 10 years. And um, we need this for proper socioeconomic data and demographic um, data to make informed decisions. So certainly, we will need to prioritize data and invest more in data to come out with um, information um, that will help us um, achieve one, um, look at the impact that we are making in the SGD area and also for socioeconomic economic development. As I speak, the next round of our population census is next year and government is adequately funding that with the support of other development partners to see to it that um, the 20 census, 2020 census is achieved. And um, <clears throat> I would also like to mention that um, for us to convince any finance minister to invest in data, one, we should see a clear demonstration of the effective use of statistics in our statistical office. 
um, because clearly, if we want to invest in something, we should see how we are utilizing it for the benefits of um, national development. Um, let me cite this example. When we aligned our SGDs, um, our budget to the SGDs, the first time we did that was 2018. And then we realized that um, for goal five, we only invested in one, just one of the indicators. And our national statistical um, um, agency that reports these things, that's the Ghana Statistical Service. During the data assessment for the 2018 budget, we realized that indeed we only invested resources in just one of um, the indicators, goal five indicators. So in the next one, that's the 2019, they were able to come up with a, a, a strategic framework that spoke to that and spoke to and, and allowed us to sort of change the way we invested um, in, uh, in the SGDs, such that we were able to give all the indicators under goal five some level of um, resources to be able to, I mean, see to it that we achieve um, goal five of the SDG. So what I'm saying is this, if you are able to give us a, a proper strategic plan of, um, of the program and also how it benefits the society and how it also uh, um, help us to also achieve national development, I think every finance, office, um, finance minister will be able or be willing to invest in that. We also know that the country um, needs to have readily accessible, consistent, and comparable socioeconomic and demographic data. And all these things need to be funded. As um, a finance minister, you also need to know what risks that are inherent in your economy. And you need data to identify all these things. So certainly, you have to invest in data to enable you to do that. And also, when you have to make um, macroeconomic um, forecasting, as a finance minister, you will need data for that. So as you invest in data, you will also be able to get those facts right, and then you can able to make the best decisions for the country. And finally, for Ghana, recently, um, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement was signed. And uh, with this, we will also have to invest in economic data as well as trade data in order to take advantage of this huge benefit that is coming to our country. And, um, and we come in, we are looking at a total population of about 1.2 billion and um, a GDP of around 3 trillion. So if, as a finance minister, quickly you are able to invest in such kind of data, it will inure to your benefits. So these are some of the things that we look into and then um, it can convince us to invest in data. Thank you, Minister. And I think I was very struck by how you were talking about the importance of data for looking backwards, which is the monitoring, and for decision making, which is the sort of present, but also the importance of data for looking forward and forecasting and how we need data in a sense for all three sort of time periods in which governments are thinking. Thank you very much indeed. Let me turn now to, to Mahmoud. As, as we've been, as we, we saw a few weeks ago, the UN Secretary General's progress report on the SDGs was, uh, was, gave, I think, a pretty clear message to all of us on the need to invest in data. Um, and the World Bank and the UN have recently signed an MOU on um, working together on the SDGs. And how, how is the World Bank working with the UN and its member states to, to really make sure that we meet the SDGs challenge to increase investment in data? Um, and do so sort of both, at, both as we think about data systems themselves and as we think about each individual goal and all the many different objectives that governments are trying to achieve. Over to you. All right. Um, thank you so much. Uh, very honored and pleased to be uh, here today. So uh, from the previous panel and from all of the session that we attended, um, we realized that the state of statistics leaves a lot to be desired. And when we are checking the VNRs, and if we talk about the role of ministries of finance and, uh, and budgets, it is sad to note that after four years, less than 10% of the VNRs had any kind of costing or budgets attached to them. I know it could be an issue of the templates, but uh, it's, uh, it worries us that when we talk about all of these ambitious objectives, the policy, the hopes, the aspirations, if they are not really attached to some sort of uh, pricing, 
and costing, um, we end up with the state that we saw in the SCAP update um, uh, on the grays, on the reds, some yellows, and very few greens. And this was the case, again, of the MDGs. When we finished the exercise of the MDGs, there were many gray cells not covering uh, what happened, uh, though that at the time were only um, uh, were required to uh, submit 60 indicators rather than 230 plus. So what's, what's different this time? I think, uh, yes, the point of finance, and I'm very happy with the emphasis of the Secretary General in his report on uh, three big areas. Data was one of them. The other two were climate and inequality. But uh, finance is important from public sources or private. But there is a great deal of importance of the enabling environment, the leadership that the minister um, uh, mentioned in the case of her country, um, um, uh, the coordination between different bodies. And I can give you just two, uh, two examples. And given that they are from history, they shouldn't really be uh, annoying anyone from my own home country. So when I was doing my, uh, my own PhD, I had an idea to test the portfolio composition of uh, uh, poor households in villages. How do you save and what do they save on? So I put the household questionnaire, asked the permission as the law um, permits me uh, or actually obliges me to do. And then until this moment, I got my PhD, my master's and everything, and um, I didn't get an, a, a reply, but one inquiry, why are you interested in the composition of the household savings in those four villages. And um, I was uh, this part of my PhD. This was not convincing enough to the good uh, uh, officer there. And that is not an issue of money. That's an issue of yes or no. I collected the data through informal ways, and I, I passed um, with that. Becoming a minister, I was chatting with the CAPNAS head at the time. Uh, that was 14 years after this survey. He said, well, your request, we're trying to find where it is, but it's in the archives. And then the other one, uh, which is much more serious than a, than a case um, like mine, it's basically the first task that I had in order to compare the different estimates of external debt of the country. There were four different figures used by the Ministry of Finance, Central Bank, and others. So what kind of finance is required in order to make the coordination here? Actually, we might be spending more in four teams doing the same thing, confusing everybody, which was actually solved by good standardization of data. So if these kind of anecdotal uh, stories could be of any help, and I, I think that shouldn't really be undermining the importance of funding. And um, um, uh, please Google World Bank Group Atlas. Um, um, for SDGs, and you'll be seeing lots of good details um, of the information, but lots of uh, missing data because of the absence of household surveys. To solve that, we're providing funding through either uh, for the countries that are uh, in need of this funding and the, the current replenishment of IDA, which is the fund for the poorest countries, having an emphasis on data collection for the purpose of uh, achieving um, the goals of, uh, of IDA. Uh, then we have a variety of partnerships. Some of them involve some funding, including our uh, partnership with the Global Partner for uh, Partnership for Sustainable Development Data with, uh, with uh, some good emphasis on our side on innovation and use of uh, technology and experimenting and what could be useful in, um, in this regard. There is a great deal as well of emphasis on the use of big data, and, uh, but I was challenged when I mentioned that in, um, in uh, Kigali, in Rwanda, uh, because they are suffering, not just them, but the whole center for um, uh, the SDGs there is suffering from lack of data. And I think you were in the room when some people say, many people are bragging about big data, or small data are missing, and with basically essential data are missing. So I think we need really to, perhaps this issue of mix between new and old, good um, uh, utilization of funds with a bit of uh, prioritization, we can get our act together, but without, good policy for data and information, and without good coordination, and a bit of localization, because localization can answer the good question that came from India earlier, to whom should I be providing the, this data? Could be the local community, which is good enough um, for you as governing body, that they need this kind of information for improvement and monitoring. If your school is funded by the World Bank, we'll be very much happy to see the impact of our uh, project in, in the schools and the children or uh, the pupils in it. So I think we are up to 
big challenges to meet the SDGs. I think we need perhaps first to abandon the old ways of categorizing data based on the three tiers. That could be good for the statisticians. For the policymakers, I think we need to have more emphasis on the critical data and fund them. Second, we need to go local um, um, uh, for the granularity of data, and that shouldn't really be undermining some very serious work that is being done, like what we heard about the internally displaced people, uh, because that can go beyond the local into um, uh, the whole country and then cross-border. And then third, I think the issues related to acceleration, that I think that will be the call of the Secretary General in one of the summits uh, at the margins of ANGA, needs really to be put in that better effective framework for action at the local level. Thank you very much. And I think a reminder to us all that the point of data is to be put to work, whether that's at the local level or, um, or the national or sometimes the global level. And we always have to keep the user in mind. What is this data for? And I think that's a, that's a really um, useful reminder for us all. And of course, helpful in terms of just talking to policymakers about raising funds, as the minister said. Um, let me talk, turn to you now, please, Lilia. Um, we've called this event Data and Innovation and How to Pay for It, but I think as, as Mahmoud really was just, um, w was just pointing out, there's more to how to pay for it than always the transfer of, of actual funds. What we're talking about is many different kinds of resources and knowledge sharing. And we know that, of course, that the ECA has, has really led the way in, across the region in this and, um, and helping countries to boost their capacity and, and, um, and share resources, and in particular around something which is on many countries' minds at the moment, which is the 2020 census round, is really the kind of big data collection issue which many governments have directly in front of them. So do you want to tell us a little bit about how ECA is, um, is working on that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for uh, giving the ECA the opportunity to be part of this uh, prestigious panel and prestigious event. I just wanted to say this panel is more uh, uh, balanced in terms of gender and you placing learned, the gender. from the previous learned. panel. <laughs> Uh, so, um, as, as you said, uh, I'm, I mean, the ECA, UN ECA, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, is one of the regional commissions. So we just heard earlier from ESCAP, which is for um, Asia Pacific. We are uh, working on Africa, and we are in a unique position as um, to, to provide the strong coordination with the African Union and the regional economic communities in Africa because we are covering the whole continent, and ECA is actually based in Addis Ababa, so we can have that interaction very closely uh, to, with the, the institutions that embodies the priorities for the African continent, and going through the regional economic communities. Uh, we have an, an, a role as an impartial convener uh, to leverage and bring to bear strategic data issues on inclusive, inclusive growth, sustainable development, trade, regional integration, natural resources management. As the minister was saying, we just went through the uh, launching of the CFTA, the Continental Free Trade Area. That requires a lot of work, uh, and coordination, and really working in partnership. Um, in terms of uh, population and housing censuses, as everyone knows, this is uh, really one of the critical tools to provide the data and to provide the data at an aggregate level, but also at the disaggregated level. And despite the fact, uh, I mean, we heard a lot of the challenges that uh, many countries are facing, and I think those challenges that were mentioned before are probably twice three times, ten times as much in Africa, depending on the country. So we know that one of the problems is the quality and consistency of data. Some of the countries, they just don't measure. Some of the countries, they measure two, three times the same data. And so we have uh, differences in, in, uh, in the data provided. And also the fact that the data is not always available uh, on time, it's not of good quality and is not disseminated, which means that it doesn't appear in the reports. I think uh, Mahmoud was saying it. If you don't provide the data to some of the institutions, it just doesn't appear. So um, the best way to get to that data at the local level and the most detailed way is to run the census. But we know that today to run any census is very costly because you have to train a bunch of people, you have to inform, you have to organize this whole logistics. 
And uh, despite the fact of what you said earlier, which is let's not jump to technology, actually our part of innovation is to really say this is what can be, wh where the technology can help and bring uh, benefit to the African continent. For, the, for now, ECA is working with um, Ethiopia and Kenya uh, to prepare more than 180,000 tablets uh, with mobile applications, with web-based application. And um, it may seem easy in a country like the one we are in, but it actually is very challenging also to use the technology because if it's not planned well, uh, and if we don't give consideration to the resources that we need to have those tablets and, and really use them in an effective way, then we are faced with uh, the problem of uh, calibration, the problem of really uh, standardization of the data, the problem of infrastructure, the problem of running the data and, and analyzing it. So even with the technology, we mm -hmm. still have some, uh, some challenges, but at least it bridges that gap and it enables the African countries to really collect the data at the local level. The second innovation uh, we are uh, trying to bring in is really to integrate geospatial uh, data with, stati with online statistical or traditional uh, data. And there, the ECA is working with uh, the countries to try and improve uh, the legislation, the policies, the standardization and the way to integrate that data into uh, traditional statistical uh, databases. Uh, we just spoke about uh, big data. In fact, big data is available and being used anyway. And it is very detailed. It's just that African countries don't have the, the framework to mm -hmm. use it and integrate it and analyze it. So this is where we come in and we are trying to build that capacity and we build it through uh, convening regional mm -hmm. meetings, working with partners, technical partners, but also uh, statistical uh, uh, offices in each country to for them to understand how to use it and how to make sure that they are using the right data and not just whatever is available. So this is also another part of it. Final point I wanted to make is really the fact that as regional commissions, we are really trying to collect uh, and create a standardized way to look at this data, to, an uh, to analyze it and use it in, um, in supporting policy um, uh, evidence-based uh, policy making. Um, we have launched recently a tool which is an integrated planning and reporting toolkit which reports on all the SDGs and the progress of each country on the SDGs, but it's, it goes beyond Africa. So it really gives a perspective on a little bit what my colleague presented earlier, but really specific to the UN. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gives a chance to see by SDG, by country, by sub-region, where we are, what is progressing, what is not progressing, and what is it that we need to do in terms of uh, adjustment and, and uh, uh, we um, uh, we adjusting the approach and, and the mechanism that are being used. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And really interesting. And I was thinking, as you were talking, I think this would be something that would be interesting to speculate on in the questions or in the questions that we talk about. Obviously, we think of innovations as something you need to be invested in, that in a sense, are a cost. But I'm also, I was interested in thinking about your census example in particular, what are the occasions on which innovation can also reduce costs in other areas and where that upfront investment can actually mean that data collection becomes more efficient and cheaper sometimes. So I think that's a, there's a, one, there's a sort of hopefully a virtuous circle that one can create with innovation and financing, which actually ultimately makes some things at least more efficient. Um, Daniel, coming to you. So first of all, let me uh, both congratulate and thank Switzerland for uh, hosting the next World Data Forum, which is now a, a regular and growing event on the, uh, on the data calendar, certainly in October 2020. And I know that Switzerland, the government of Switzerland has been doing a lot of thinking about how to make sure that that forum as well as delivering interesting content and stimulating conversation and all of the networking and so on that we see at those events, that it actually delivers substantive commitments, particularly around this, um, this agenda on financing and investments in data. So it would be great to hear from you what Switzerland is doing, but even more what you expect from all of us on the panel and everybody in the room. What is it that we collectively should be doing so that we are 
have the best opportunity in October 2020 to really see progress on this agenda. Okay, thank you very much for this for this question and for the invitation. It was really interesting for me to to follow the discussions. I'm a, a policy maker, more into domestic policy and not at all into statistics, uh, data monitoring, etc. Although we obviously need this very much for our policy making, and uh, believe me, it's uh, we uh, for in Switzerland. Obviously, it's, it's a very highly developed country, and but still, it's hard to uh, get uh, the, the 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 some sometimes the, the necessary resources resources for doing this this kind of monitoring because um, the, the sense of doing this is not always understood politically especially disaggregated data for uh, like a minority communities these data are not always uh, very popular with some politicians who then do the policy making based on on data so this is a, a really important topic also it's not that important to get the resources either in my, my country we have to justify a lot why we're doing this and it's sometimes hard to get together the money even the domestically. But yes, as you said, we are very proud, obviously, to host the next uh, World Data Forum in Bern, which will uh, uh, take place in October 2020. Uh, in Switzerland, in the capital, we're expecting about 1,500 people from over 100 countries, so uh, policymakers, uh, statisticians, and other stakeholders uh, from uh, various groups on the domestic and uh, foreign policy uh, areas. So continuing with the uh, Cape Town uh, Global Action Plan, obviously, which set out the the uh, the, the agenda for uh, what we need to do uh, for uh, sustainable development uh, monitoring, and um, uh, which was also discussed in Dubai. So this is the third World Data Forum, and, and Switzerland is basically having two tracks, two tracks to um, prepare to try to prepare this World Data Forum in order to have a, a nice, uh, an interesting outcome um, of this uh, of this event. So. First of all, is the, the first uh, uh, track is what we call the, the road to burn. Road to burn is uh, uh, both on the domestic and uh, international uh, side, uh, trying to um, uh, support the to support exchange on different topics which are going to be discussed at the World Data Forum uh, on the international side, but also to support the implementation internally in Switzerland. So we're trying to set up uh, some some different conferences to to s sensitize different actors about the importance of data and more generally on on the sustainable development and the the SDGs because the 2030 agenda is not yet that well known in some local communities or with some stakeholders even back home uh, in my country so road to burn is basically uh, focusing on on five key um, uh, messages which uh, one is obviously leave no one behind the the importance of disaggregated uh, data data, etc. Uh, accountability, so this is also important to, to show um, how we deliver on the different commitments we made, both internally and um, uh, on, the, on in foreign policy and, and ODA. Then the different kinds of data sources, new data sources, obviously, which have to be integrated. It's not just about um, uh, national statistical offices, but obviously we have we have uh, huge opportunities with new kinds of data which have to match and integrate this this kind of system. Then all about communication. I mean, uh, I'm from the policymaker side, and we don't understand the stat statisticians and vice versa. This is just a fact, even today. And I think we have to to foster to strengthen this collaboration and to do as we said before, storytelling. It's not just about uh, basic data or even uh, uh, nice nice publication. We have to to, to, to tell stories with that, to have a real change in, in policy. And uh, the, the, the last point is research and uh, development. Obviously, it's not just the data itself, but what we do from this will, uh, on the uh, more analytical side. So innovation is, is very important, this is uh, for sure. But it's not only about uh, innovation. We also need, um, obviously, a better coordination of the existing resources. And uh, we need to mobilize more in the national uh, resources for uh, data and monitoring and the last point I think everyone agrees on on the three points I hope at least uh, we need uh, a higher share obviously of the ODA for data and statistics which uh, which is quite important and that leads me to the other track which Switzerland is using uh, to try to prepare this uh, World Data Forum 2020, which is the burn network on financing data uh, for development we had um, 
interesting meetings uh, last year uh, at the uh, at this, uh, the at, at this uh, HLPF uh, last year. We had uh, an, a high-level meeting in Bern in January to, to discuss about this topic. We had a very interesting side event uh, last Friday at the, Swiss, uh, the Swiss mission to discuss about that. So we need um, more and, and better data. And uh, obviously, this, this implies that we need, we need some more uh, funding as well. And especially, we need to bring together the communities uh, of national statistical offices with uh, other uh, ministries, organizations, with the private sector, and also with the, with the big donors. And this is really the aim of this of this urban network on financing for development, uh, to, to bring these actors together, to, to strengthen, to have more uh, resources, to do really a, a good um, uh, data and monitoring system worldwide, and to, to, to make the capacity building which is needed to do that. So um, this is basically the two tracks. Um, and um, we want to use as as the organizers, as the hosts of the next World Data Forum, we want to 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 make use of, of different kinds of international events which are going to take place uh, over the next uh, few months and, and and until uh, October 2020. So that is for obviously the EDSG summit in September. We're trying to have um, a side event on that. Uh, we want to use the OECD uh, DAC. We want to use the uh, annual meeting of the World Bank in. October for that. Uh, we even tried to, to make it as, a, as an important topic uh, at the, the World Economic Forum in, in Davos in, in, in next January. So these, these are different steps where we try to, to talk about these things um, and to try to, to, to find solutions for the different um, uh, problems or, or tasks I just mentioned uh, in order to have a real, a really, a really good outcome and to have the necessary commitments in October 2020. Thank you very much indeed, um, and thank you to all of you. I mean, I think between you on the panel, we've covered the different kinds of resources and investments which are needed to really make progress on this agenda. The, the, the money, obviously, um, is a key one, but also the kind of institutional um, commitments and the sort of fine-tuning of the institutional framework that, that Mahmoud was talking about, and then, of course, the sort of knowledge sharing and the, the capacity development that the ECA has been leading on, as well as the focus um, specifically on the, the money and the kind of absolute need for, for financial resources to pay for this that the minister and, uh, and Daniel were talking about. So let me now open it up to the panel. Okay, I happen to be glancing over here and saw two hands, so... Let me start with you, Mark, and then Eric. Okay, just get the mic to hit to Mark in the front here, please. <laughs> the mark to mic. Thank you very much, and uh, great panels, great event. Um, so I'm Mark Herriwood. I'm the Chief of Data and Analytics for UNICEF, and uh, very much appreciated the shout-out from the Minister about the, uh, the mix in Sierra Leone, but also Mahmoud talking about the importance of household surveys and, and that we have to have something to stand on as we reach for the innovations. And, and to me, the how to pay for it actually applies to that probably more than uh, for data innovations. Data innovations can attract excited money, uh, whereas boring, old, reliable, foundational statistics are, uh, in fact, my experience with Mix, harder to get funding for. So I just wondered if, if the panel would like to reflect on that. Thank you. And please, Abek in the back. Thank you. That was an, a really illuminating session. I'm Mobik Sen, Head of Innovation and Partnerships at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, my uh, question is based on a, a, a recent experience uh, that we had. So we were, you know, uh, my colleague uh, Nabil mentioned uh, how Bangladesh is innovating by creating this SDG tracker. And I was uh, in Bangladesh not so long ago as part of a technical assistance project uh, where we were trying to develop an evidence-based policy. And uh, there was a huge data gap in that particular area, which was around sanitation and hygiene. So I went to meet the head of Bangladesh statistics in his office to figure out why this was the case being such a fundamental issue. And the, it, the problem was obviously not very surprising, lack of resources. But they had come up with a really innovative solution to address this gap. And that was that sort of water aid was a big operator in Bangladesh, and it still is. I don't know if there's anybody from water aid here. So the deal they had reached with water aid was that water aid would invest in collecting the wash data. And the statistics office would 
verify it and, and, and make sure that the data is credible. But then the data collected by WaterAid would become the official na national data set on WASH for Bangladesh. And this worked for everybody concerned in that situation. WaterAid got its data to inform its programming, and Bangladesh got the data for policy making. And I'm not sure whether, uh, the, you know, um, and I was just wondering, like, this, would, this is a great way of addressing the resource crunch and could be perhaps scaled up and replicated in so many situations. And I was just wondering whether there are other examples like this that people could share with us. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm tempted, in fact, I won't for reasons of time, but I'm quite tempted to throw both of your questions back at you. I mean, I think that, I think that you know, the survey programs absolutely require investment, but as we know, also, there are many different survey programs, and you know, it may be that there would be more efficient ways of gathering the same information if different survey programs were to... Um, to work effectively together in different countries. I know that is happening in many cases, but I think there are ways, and similarly, you know, the sort of cooperation between different data collectors, um, whether that be survey, global survey programs or different kinds of institutions collecting data in different countries. So I think these are the kind of institutional innovations that, uh, that we are absolutely in the market for here. Uh, let me invite any other questions. I know there was a gentleman at the back who didn't get who I wasn't able to come to last time, so I don't know, sir, if your question is still relevant for this panel. Um, please, gentlemen here at the back. Thank you very much. Partly, actually, it has been responded, but please, let me... You introduce yourself. Uh, my name is John Kalage. I come from Tanzania. I work for an organization called Hakelim. I understand many countries, including mine, are st uh, struggling in terms of generating enough data to monitor the uh, SDGs. And from the recent report, it appeared that only 40% of data could be generated. So I was actually wondering how, how uh, traditional uh, data sources could be capacitated in order to generate data that could inform the, uh, the process of generating official statistics in order to increase the data that uh, can be uh, can be used to monitor SDGs. Thank you very much. Let me invite. I see a lady over here. Please, lady in green. Hi, uh, my name is Rory Munshine. I'm a member of UNA USA. Um, I had a quick question about the extent to which you work with the private sector to either develop mobile applications or to utilize mobile applications to generate user data. Um, to get information for your projects? And if so, what are some of those challenges as it relates to user privacy and principle four? Thanks. Thank you very much. I mean, I, absolutely, it's important to cover the spectrum. We've, we've talked a lot about citizen-generated data this, this afternoon and mentioned GIS systems. And of course, mobile data is a, is a kind of third really critical type of data here, which comes with its own issues. Gentlemen here and the... Uh, Thank you. My name is James Mwanz. I work with Vital Strategies. And my question is, uh, to what extent do we work with communities where this data comes from? Um, listening to the panel, which was a great panel, very little was coming about communities and how much we get them involved. And I think one of the innovations, in my view, uh, I don't know if any one of us has ever taken a step to walk in the streets and ask, people, what is STG? You'll be very surprised, or probably even in this group, you might be surprised what we really, how we really connect with SDGs. And I think that is the beginning of the issues. And when you look at the profiling of data, where are we lacking data from? It's really the hard to reach areas. And that's where I think we need to focus some of these institutional innovations we are talking about here. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one last question. If anybody, if you're formulating a thought, the first person to get their hand up will be able to express that thought. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you. And I think especially for that last question, if I might be allowed to just uh, make one remark, which is I think, you know, we often see data collection, data very much as a sort of a technical exercise. And But I think that the that the power of being asked about yourself and your, I was privileged to, to be in, in Ghana recently and um, to be accompany some um, enumerators who were going, who were doing a sort of test run of, in fact, a household survey. And one thing that I was so struck by was the, the kind of 
pleasure that the respondents took in being asked for their opinion and the sense of engagement. And I asked them afterwards about the experience, you know, how did it feel to be surveyed and to answer those questions? And just the sort of pride that they took in being asked and in really feeling like they were making a contribution to their government's effectiveness and that their government in return was asking what they, you know, asking about their lives and was interested. So I think that while data is a product, it's also an interaction. And I think that that sort of interaction is, is also so important as we're thinking both about how we collect data, how we use data, and what data means in the context of a government system which is ultimately trying to achieve those outcomes of the SDGs. So let me uh, now invite the panelists. Uh, Mahmoud, you look like you are absolutely ready to go there. So why don't you kick uh, off? <laughs> I'm not quite and, uh, sure after you comment. And but, uh, answer, uh, <laughs> answer the questions. And I'll try, I'll come try. back in this order, please. Right, thank you. Uh, I'll try to uh, make some uh, reactions, um, not complete answers uh, necessarily. So based on the uh, first on the partnership with the private sector and um, the mobile companies and uh, the uh, GSMA, we had many agreements. And uh, now, in specific cases coming from Haiti and Bangladesh, we use uh, mobile data to uh, monitor, uh, for instance, uh, accidents in the roads to avoid them in the case of Bangladesh. We use mobile data for uh, matchmaking of job opportunities in, uh, in Haiti. In our very specific project monitoring and evaluation, we use uh, data from the field to uh, monitorize. I was trying uh, to mention the case of the school, uh, schools, hospitals, about the progress of the implementation and uh, from the beneficiaries, which are basically the communities. And we don't do that randomly. It's based on a, on a system of a feedback that gets the whole bank in the headquarters and the task team leaders involved um, in them. So there are many good ways of collection of data to, f to feed uh, us with better uh, information. The other, the, the other thing on, um, in, in these issues related to data systems, that um, now, and I think everybody needs to take an opportunity of that in, if you happen to be in Africa, because uh, we have a very big program uh, about digital transformation of, Af uh, of Africa. It used to be called the Moonshots Approach, but now the new president is calling it digital transformation using the country platforms. And this is about building the DNA of countries. This is data, networks, and basic artificial intelligence. And we have many countries from the African continent have already signaled their interest in partnership um, um, uh, for that. And there are going to be a great deal of opportunities, again, with the issue of using uh, joint platforms and joint data sets while we're doing this huge thing that's going to be having a policy similar to the European GDPR or the Australian or the Brazilian approach of protecting data. It has, as well, policies to establish good systems for retrieving the data, protecting them, and good systems, as well, for the analytics, because big data systems re require more sophisticated uh, information. And, and, and finally, I'd like to give an, another example about, uh, and final example, about using uh, technology and partnership, as we did with Gates Foundation and Gallup, to uh, collect information on uh, financial uh, inclusion. Now we have better data, more frequently, more up-to-date, and equally important with a fraction of the cost that used to be there back to, uh, 10 years um, ago. While everything is getting more expensive, this kind of smart approach is uh, saving us data. So f for, your, for your important question that I bet you'll have a better answer than me for it, is basically we don't need really to have the perfect enemy of the good. If we manage to have, uh, get household surveys, we get them. Al until we get them, we use proxies, but that is not a substitute. So we use mm -hmm. both systems to get us better information. Thank you, Mahmoud. Minister. Thank you. Um, from the questions that were asked, um, truly innovation must not always lead to doling out more funds, but finding ways of using it efficiently. Um, I can cite three examples from, um, from Ghana. The National Statistics Office, that's the Ghana Statistical Service, currently is in um, partnership with um, the National Communication Authority. They are more, in terms of um, uh, resources, they are more endowed. And so um, currently there's a, there's a survey, a, a computer survey going on to assess ICT um, uh, monitoring of uh, the SGDs. And the cost or the burden has been shifted 
on the more endowed um, agency. So um, NCA leverages on um, its um, capacity building, um, what they have, and to help them build their capacity, and at the same time, get the kind of data that they need to um, sort of assess the implementation of the SGDs. There's also another collaboration between um, and government, civil society organizations, the academia, and the private entities. They have also come up with um, what is called the National Data Quality Assurance Framework. And um, this one will help them channel out um, data that can be used by the Ghana Statistical Service. And this one too, the burden of financing has been shifted or shared amongst all these people. So this is the innovation that we are talking about. And then currently, um, Parliament passed a bill not too long ago um, asking every district or asking that we create um, statistical offices in every district that's at the lower level. So all the municipals, the metropolitans, and the district assemblies are supposed to have district statistics offices. And so right from the beginning, data is going to come from the district level. And this one to the, the burden um, of, um, of the budget and the activities is at the local government level. So it is also not on the, the National Statistics Agency, yet they are going to go all out and get that disaggregated data that they need to, um, to inform um, policy and decision making. So for me, I believe that um, the innovation should not necessarily result in giving out more funding, but finding ways or partnership to share um, the costs to reduce the burden at the same time getting what you really wanted to get from um, data. Thank you, Minister. Daniel, Thank you very much. So most of the, the questions uh, were quite quite technical, so it doesn't exactly my field of competence, but maybe on, on the question on, on innovation, I think innovation can can indeed uh, be, be a very good lever for for having better better data and, and using them better in the decision making process. But I, I still believe, as I said, that in some cases more financing is needed, and this is the case in the, for, from national resources, but also from from ODA, a uh, part of the ODA, uh, to to be sure that the uh, the the programs really have the impact which is uh, which we're looking for. So this is something really important, and, and maybe to, to come back to to to, to uh, my case of a country where we have a, a lot of information and, uh, and good reports on, on, on what we need to do. It doesn't necessarily mean that these information is, are really uh, transmitted to the decision makers, especially uh, in, in the parliament. And so this is probably um, a field where we have to do an extra effort. Thank you. And Lilia. Thank you very much. Um, on my, on my part as well, I'm not, I'm not going to give specific answers to specific questions, but just uh, a few comments. Uh, first one on the partnership with the private sector. The UN has uh, uh, signed the Global Compact many years ago with the private sector. So this structures the relationship and the partnership and working with the private sector. So yes, we do work with the private sector under certain condition and in a structured way, but that is absolutely welcome. Uh, and I think in the field of data, a lot of it can come from the private sector and, 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 and is readily there. So we should find ways to access it, use it, especially for the African countries, because they don't have the system to collect it as well as many of the big companies. So if it is there, then uh, we should, and, and this is what ECA is working on, is to see how we can integrate or how we can build the system in each country so that they can integrate this data, but at the same time, uh, ensure, um, make sure that they have quality assurance system and make sure that they are not bridging the confidentiality and, and all the other aspects that touch on people uh, information. But definitely that will give us, uh, that will bridge a gap and, and give us a chance to to leap, leapfrog or, or really go one step or 10 steps forward. Um, on the question for uh, the communities, I think if, if we didn't speak so much about the local communities is that we try to set up a certain way of, of collecting the data with the government, but then everything, most of the things happen at the local level and local with the local communities, not necessarily involving the institution itself or the ECA itself, but really through the mechanism in the country itself to collect that data at, uh, at the local level. Um, Mahmoud spoke about uh, digital transformation. The same for ECA, we, uh, we launched the um, uh, Digital uh, Center for, uh, for Excellence, and this is to really uh, promote uh, digital ID and, and really give a face to everyone 
I think 500, 500 million persons in Africa don't have even an ID. So this is for the inclusion and give everyone an ID, but also for uh, using the technology and leveraging technology to make things more effective. Um, and that is the role of ECN. I'm happy uh, I heard uh, the minister from Ghana say what's happening. We try to leverage the good experiences and the lessons learned from different countries on the African continent and mm -hmm. use them to build the capacity and create that network within the continent mm -hmm. so that it comes together. And final point is really to say that what we are trying to do is to help the countries produce and de develop their own system and produce their own data rather than relying on data that is just available on the market. And this is what has been the missing link in Africa, is the, it is the fact that you rely on data that may be complete, may not be complete, mm -hmm. but you don't have your own view of your own situation in your own country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. There's three things that I'm so happy have come out of today. First is the point, the focus on usefulness and thinking about the usefulness of data where it needed to be. The second is the critical link between innovation and the foundational data, the surveys, the, the, uh, the management systems. And the third, of course, is the circularity of resources, that we shouldn't just think of innovation always as a cost, but it can also help to reduce costs in other areas. So I'm delighted. Thank you so much for a great conversation. Thank you again to the other panelists. Big round of applause, please, for panel two. Thank you to all of you for coming for great questions. Uh, thanks again to our partners uh, on this event, and I wish you all a very good afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your week.